Hello, Mobile County fabulous fifth graders. Welcome back. I hope you've had a good week. I hope you've been working on your packets and on your online classes and everything's been going well. We're going to once again start with word work and our objective is to use combined knowledge of letter and sound correspondences, syllabication patterns and morphology to read accurately unfamiliar multisyllabic words in context and out of context. And what we're working on really is we work on both. I give you the out of context and then we read it in our sentences and see if it makes sense. So our essential question, again, how do I figure out a new word by breaking it down into its parts? That's the best thing. When you come across a word, break it down to those words that are, are even sounds that you know and maybe could recognize in other words. Let's start with a tiny bit of a review of the Greek and Latin roots that we did last, um, that we did Monday. The first one was aster. Do you remember what that stood for? Or any words that we used with it? Yes, it's star, and we talked about astronauts and asteroids and asterisks, okay? The next one, speck. Anybody remember what it meant? Yeah, to look. You could be a speck. Tater. It could be spectacular. Something that you, when I think of something that's spectacular, I think about like what. I believe my child's school is um, probably one of the best ones I could have picked in Mobile. She's in the PACE program. The teachers are phenomenal. The principal, I uh, couldn't ask for a better principal. The research that I had done myself, I believe the quality of education in Mobile County public school system is excellent. For me and my child, I'm going to stick with the public school system. I think it's the way to go. Hey guys, welcome back. So sorry, a few little technical difficulties. Welcome to live TV. Our third word that we talked about last week was mal. Does anybody remember what that, what that meant? Bad, yes. And we talked about malicious and bad, that was bad of uh, gossip, okay, and malware. You don't want to get malware on your computer. So let's start with some new this week. Graph. What do you think about when you hear graph? Now remember, these are root words. They're just letters put together for sounds. They don't really stand by themselves. Although when you think of graph, a lot of times maybe you think of graph paper. Well, that's not the same thing exactly. It means written. I guess you do write on graph paper, you plot your points and everything, but this is written. Let's look at some words. We have biography, graffiti, and paragraph. All right, biography, graph. You know about biographies. Well, if we break it down even more, bio, what did bio mean last week? It meant life. So this is life and written, okay? So a biography, when you, you, we think of, we read biographies, we're reading stories about other famous people's lives, like maybe a biography about President Trump or uh, President Barack Obama or President Bill Clinton. Okay, let's look at our sentence. A vast number of biographies are written about famous people. You don't write biographies about plain Jane everyday people. Nobody would want to read about famous hits. You'd want to read about somebody famous like Taylor Swift or Michael Jordan. Okay? This second word, I already said it, but can you say it with me? Graffiti. Think about graffiti. What do you think? It's written, but where have you heard that word? I think about, I used to live close to train tracks. And every afternoon, the coal train would come through, and it would have these beautiful written words. Now, it's on public property, so that's not really beautiful, but it was all very colorful. So graffiti is, the, is, is written tagging on public property. Carly got arrested for all the graffiti in the bathroom, okay? I hope none of you, my fifth graders write on the bathroom walls, but if you do, it would be graffiti, okay? Not something you really want to do. Paragraph. We all know about paragraphs. What is graph? It's written. You pair the ideas together in paragraphs, okay? Jason was not ready to write a five-paragraph paper. Now, I know all of Mobile County fifth graders, fourth graders even, are very ready to write 
five paragraph papers. You might not like to, but you're ready for it. Our next one, auto. What do you think about when you hear auto? Do you think about maybe your car, your mom's car, your dad's car? I do, okay? That auto, it's a car, right? So auto must mean car, right? Nope. Auto means self. Huh, that's interesting. My car is mine, but it's not me. It's not myself. How does that work? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at auto in a few words. Autograph. Okay, auto, what does it mean? Yes, it means self. Okay, so if you come up to somebody and you ask for their autograph, we already talked about graph, it's written, you're wanting them to self-sign something. Okay, so an autograph. Jane waited all day to get Taylor Swift's autograph. Okay, autobiography. Well, we just broke biography down. We talked bio was life, graph was written. So this is written about somebody's life, but what is auto? It means self. So this is something that a famous person writes about themselves. Okay, let's look at it in a sentence. To learn more about the celebrity, you need to read his autobiography that he wrote himself. Automobile, this is your car, your mom's car, your dad's car, the Tahoe, the minivan. All right, self. Again, we just said, I'm not my car, my car's not me, so why is it self? Well, I get in my car, I, I crank it, but it runs by itself. I'm not Fred Flintstone, I don't put my, my feet out and run it. It's self-running, so that's automobile. Future automobiles will truly be self-moving. They're doing all kinds of things now where the automobiles can, get, there's no driver. I don't know that I'd ever want to ride in that, but that's the way, they're, they're truly be self-moving. Let's look at another Greek and Latin root. Tract, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Mm, let's see, it means to pull or to drag. Now what comes to mind? Let's look, now remember, Greek and Latins are not always prefixes, they're not always suffixes, sometimes they're in the middle of words, like an attraction. It's in the middle. Attraction, to pull somebody in. What do you do to attract people to come? Or maybe you remember learning about gravity and it's pull on things, it's attraction to keep things in orbit, okay? Cinderella's castle is one of Disney World's main attractions, and it is. It's in all of their Disney Worlds. It's in Disney World Tokyo, Disney World over in Europe, okay? They have a Cinderella's palace. Tractor. Now, that's what I thought of when I saw tract, because we have tractors. We pull things, okay? You pull or you drag things behind in a tractor, with a tractor. Growing large quantities of crops is much easier now that we bought a large tractor because you can plant more, you can pull more, okay? Extract, okay? Track, it means to pull or to drag. I thought of when I saw that, I thought, oh yeah. Before I could get my braces, I had to have four teeth extracted. I actually had to have more than that, but to pull, okay? Does that, do those make sense? So maybe hopefully next time when you see one of these Greek or Latin words, you can root words, you'll be able to pull a word apart and figure it out. Okay, let's go to reading. Our objective today is analyze multiple accounts of the same event or topic, noting important similarities and differences in the point of view that they represent. So we need to look when we're looking reading, what do they have in common? What are they, what, what's different? Essential question, how does the author's point of view and purpose shape and direct the text? So what the author is writing, how do they feel about that? How do they think about that? What's their opinion about it? It's going to shape how the article turns out. They're going to, if we want to persuade you to do something, we're going to use persuasive words, okay, our word choice. If we love something, we're going to talk about how beautiful and 
glowing and wonderful it is. If we don't like it, we're going to write about it in a gross, kind of nasty way. It's our word choices, okay? That's where your antonyms and synonyms come in. So, let's look at this one about how an author feels about this particular topic. The chicken noodle soup smelt yummy. I could not wait to eat its warm, soothing, comforting goodness. Whenever I did not feel good, mom always cooked me soup to make me feel better. How does this author feel about chicken noodle soup? Does she hate it? Does he love it? Yes, he loves it. How do you know? Yes, it talks about soothing, comforting goodness. If I hated something, would I call it good? If I totally disliked something, would I call it comforting? Those we use, those are the words that we talk about when we like something. Okay, let's look at the next one. I walked into the smell of boiled chicken. It brought back memories of being sick for days. The slimy noodles and the thick, disgusting broth makes me shiver and my stomach turn flips. Does this person like chicken noodle soup? No. And this is the thing, we don't always know, the author doesn't explicitly tell us these things, so we have to break down what, we have to think about what they're writing and what word choice they used. And then we will know how to go. So, this author does not like chicken noodle soup. Let's look at this one. Let's see how this author feels about recycling. Recycling is one of the most important things you can do for the planet. The average person makes about four pounds of garbage each day. Most of that garbage ends up in a landfill. A landfill is a giant field covered in tons of stinky, rotten garbage. So what is this author trying to tell us? Yes, that recycling is very important. Okay, what does this author think about landfills? Does she think they're good? What do you think? What does it say? What evidence do you have? It says that a landfill is a giant field covered in tons of stinky, rotten garbage. Now, I'm sorry, but I don't like my garbage can on Tuesday because it goes out to the street on Wednesday because it's stinky, it's nasty, it's, got, it's rotten. So how would you feel if you lived next to a stinky, rotten garbage? Would, it, would you want it? So landfills for her or him, she does not like. Okay? All right. I want to look at some perspectives on three, three different perspectives on school uniforms. That is something that I know third grade teachers, fourth grade teachers, a lot of times when we want to, fifth grade teachers, when we want you to write an opinion piece, this is one of the prompts we give you. What do you feel about uniforms? Okay, so I want us to, we're going to read three, and then we're going to come back and talk about each one. Okay, so I don't think kids should have to wear a uniform to school. Uniforms are not comfortable. Kids need to be comfortable to learn. I can't pay attention if I'm stuck in itchy, weird fitting clothes all day. Uniforms can be expensive for parents. Parents have to buy their kids regular clothes and uniform clothes. That is two sets of clothes. Lastly, I think something that I think uniforms are boring. Kids should be able to wear something that may, matches their personality. School uniforms are not a good idea. That's Jack's opinion. Let's look at the second uniform paragraph. Uniforms are a great idea. Uniforms will get me out of the house so much quicker in the morning. Won't have to pick out an outfit. I won't have to argue with my mom about what to wear. Kids that wear uniforms won't be worried about what other kids are wearing at school. They will be able to pay attention to their teacher instead of looking at everyone's clothes. Everyone will look neat and clean in their uniforms. Wearing uniforms is a great way to bring the school together. 
Emma. Our third uniform paragraph. As a teacher, I want my students to feel comfortable in my classroom. I want my students to be able to pay attention to our lessons. I do not like to see students distracted by their clothes. School uniforms are great for some students. School uniforms may be a terrible idea for other students. You must look at both sides of the issue. Okay, so Jack's perspective. What did Jack think? Did Jack like them or not? Jack does not like them. How do we know? What proof, what evidence do we have? Well, we have what he says in the very first sentence. I don't think kids should have to wear uniforms. <laughs> Plain as day, it tells you right there. But what, ev what else does he use? What other reasoning? That cannot be our only answer. We have to go through the whole paragraph and think about it again. You, get, you can't just stop at the first. He also says uniforms are not comfortable. Okay? If uniforms aren't comfortable, nobody likes them. He says they're itchy and weird. He says they can be expensive. He says, I think uniforms are boring. He didn't like them. Let's look at Emma's. What did she think? Emma thinks they're great. How did I know that? What proof did I have that they're great? Well, her very first sentence. And a lot of times in opinions, this is your topic sentence, and it tells you what I think. It's your thesis. It's what you think. Uniforms are a great idea. She told me that right off. What did she use to back it up? How do I know? She says they're so much quicker in the morning. Says she won't have to argue with her mom. Nobody really likes to start their day off arguing with somebody. She won't have to be worried about what other people are wearing. says so they'll be able to pay attention to the teacher. And lastly, it says, look neat and clean. Who doesn't want to look neat and clean? So she thinks they're great. Jack did not like them. The teacher, her perspective was, thinks they can be good and bad. Look at it both ways. Well, how do I know? Well, it says that she wants her students to pay attention. So that's a good thing. But... They might be distracted by their clothes if they didn't have a uniform, or maybe they're distracted by their clothes because their uniform doesn't fit anymore. Uh, so uniforms are great for some students, but they may be a terrible idea for others. Okay, so now, we just read about Emma, we just read about Jack, so I want you to think about who, if I had these statements, who do you think would agree with which? Schools that require uniforms are safer. Now, Jack didn't like them. Emma did like them. So maybe Emma would think that they're safer? Yeah, good job. Look at this one. Studies show that uniforms do not improve performance in the classroom. So who might would hold on to that idea? Yep, Jack. Good job. Wearing uniforms help to show school pride. I remember Emma said something about it brings the school together. So if you're together and you're prideful, you're showing that spirit shirt. Yep, Emma. Look at this last one. Wearing uniform forces all kids to be the same. Kids will never learn to solve problems on their own. That would be Jack. Okay. Hmm. Popular topic also, especially in fifth grade. Should cell phones be used in school? Hmm. So let's look at these two perspectives. Yes, I think students should be able to use their cell phones during school. Many cell phones today have special apps that kids can use during class. These apps can help kids learn how to do math problems, write their own storybooks, or research a topic for science class. Cell phones and technology are really important to our future. 
teachers should help students use their cell phone to learn. Kids will need to know how to use technology when they get a job. Cell phones are also really fun. Students will pay better attention in class if they get to use their cell phone. Sincerely, Steve. No, I don't think students should be allowed to use their cell phones during school. Students are in school to learn. If kids always depend on their cell phones to do work, they will never learn anything. Students should learn how to do math problems on their own instead of relying on a cell phone to do it for them. It's important that kids learn how to use libraries and read books. Cell phones can't replace your brain. Students who have cell phones at their desk won't pay attention in class. Students will be on social media websites instead of paying attention to their teachers. Kids will use their cell phones to text each other during class. Texting should lead to could lead to cheating on tests. Sincerely, Penny. Now, by listening to my voice, which one do you think Miss Hicks agrees with? <laughs> yeah, Miss Hicks kind of leads leans towards Penny. But let's look. What was Steve's opinion? What did Steve think? Steve believes that students should be allowed to use their cell phones in school. I agree to a certain, certain amount if you were using it for the right purposes. What were his reasonings? His first reason was kids can use the apps to help them learn math, write stories, and do research. Yeah, you could do research for papers. You could, you could figure out how to go to Khan Academy and learn something about math if you needed to. Let's look at Steve's second reason. Kids will need technology in the future, and teachers can help them learn how on their cell phones. Okay? Maybe teachers can, and there's wonderful apps out there with like vocabulary and Nearpod and things like that. So, yeah, teachers could use those. His last one, <laughs> cell phones are fun. That's it. It's all you need. How many of you agree with Steve's opinions? Could you tell how he felt just by his word choice? Remember Penny. Penny and I kind of agree a little bit. Penny said, Penny thinks that students should not use cell phones during school. I kind of agree. They can be distracting. Let's look at her reasoning. Students need to rely on their brain, not their cell phones. Because, you know, what happens if your cell phone dies? Or you leave it at home? Hmm, I don't know. Students will not pay attention in class. They will be on social media. Some students, she's right. That's what they do. Last reason. Penny's last reason is she feels that texting will lead to cheating. Okay? Good job, guys. That's where we're going to stop today. Next week, we're going, to learn, we're going to work with looking at the American Revolution from two points of view. Okay? Have a great weekend.